order, if everybody is good with that. Everybody hear me okay? All that good? Perfect. All right, uh, Karen, can we get a certification of quorum, please? Uh, yes, we have quorum. We currently have 19 members present. All right, thank you. Welcome, everyone. I see guys here again. I was looking at him yesterday. All right, so I just have a, a few remarks. Um, Samantha and I attended the uh, Conservation Ontario Council annual general meeting April 12th. At the meeting, Sam was re-elected for a second term on the board of directors, and we continue to support Samantha's expanded role on that council. And a nice congratulations to Samantha. It's really good that we have people up on those organizations and have an ear to the ground. So she's doing great work with that and with the provincial task force. So congratulations, Sam, and thank you for all the work with that. Um, we had a uh, the GRCA and the GRCF hosted a virtual town hall on April 15th to discuss the uh, status of the Guelph Lake Nature Center. There's been some concern with the, the bit of, we've had a, a delay because of the pandemic and the, we're trying to figure out who we, who we, what we can fund and so forth going forward. So we thought we'd reach out to the donors and give them an update and let them know that we're still waiting for the final regs and so forth and the mandate and how we're gonna reinvigorate the um, fundraising campaign because even with increased uh, uh, costs with construction and so forth, we're fairly close, right? The, 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 the target was around 2 million. We're sitting at one seven. A lot of the stuff on the ground has already been done. So we just wanted to make sure that the donors we're aware that from the board perspective and the last thing we passed, we're still in support. There may be just some issues around how some of the operational items are funded. So with that, um, we also, um, we are supporting the uh, mental health and well-being of the Grand River residents during the lockdown. The Grand River parks with the exception of the Allura Quarry will open for limited day use on April 23rd ahead of May 1st. So it's about a week or so earlier. Due to the stay at home order, seasonal and overnight camping at all GRCA parks has been suspended until further orders are lifted, but it's nice to see the parks open early. I know people wanna, wanna get out there. Certainly gonna be a, an interesting summer if we continue to be in lockdown and the capacity at the parks and so forth. So we'll look. So that's today, right? Chris, Sorry? That's today. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just saying that it, it's nice that they're doing this because um, but the staff are, we had the report last week or last meeting about how, you know, how difficult it is at the park right now. So we look forward to supporting the park staff as, as they move forward with that. The GRCA will be applying another round of treatment to protect tree and forest and control the gypsy moth infestation at Pinehurst and Brant conservation areas in the spring. These properties will be temporarily closed to the public while the treatment is being applied. A news release will be issued in advance to inform members of the public and campers will be informed directly. As discussed at the March board meeting, GRCA staff are reviewing and gathering information regarding their requested exemptions for term limits of chair and vice chair positions on the Conservation Authority Board. An information report will be brought back to the board in the next few months. So we're trying to see what the other conservation areas are doing and, and, and we have a path forward with this. There's no, there's no rush. We don't wanna leave it late, but we wanna get it right. And we don't wanna be the, the only one talking to the province. We understand there's only one letter or so in, but I've spoken to a couple of chairs. So there's some interest in moving on that. It just may take a little, little time. All right. So the first meeting we're gonna have, of course, today is the Source Protection Authority meeting. I don't know if anybody had any questions or comments on the chair's remarks, we good to go? All right, thank you. So I have a motion that the agenda for the Source Protection Authority meeting be approved as circulated. Moved by Bernie, seconded by Brian. Any opposed? All right, declare the meeting open. Any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, the minutes of the previous motion, uh, meetings, a uh, motion that the minutes of the Source Protection Authority meeting of December 18th, 2020 be approved as circulated. Moved by Sue, seconded by Marcus. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. And then business arising from previous minutes, none. No delegations during these presentations. Correspondence. Uh, okay, so Lake Erie Source Protection Committee 202 Grand River motion that the correspondence from the Lake Erie Region Source Protection Committee regarding the 2020 Grand River Annual Progress Reports be received for information. Moved by John, seconded by Ian. Any questions? Do you have a question, Sue? 
Yes, I do. It was about the, um, the so the Haldeman documents have not been put in yet, correct? That's what the report was saying. We were missing just Haldeman. Um, does that mean that we have to follow up with Haldeman to make sure they get their uh, information in? Sam, I'm going to. Yes. Uh, Martin, are you on the call? I see Martin's there. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, yes, so thank you for the, for the question and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, Haldeman missed the submission deadline, uh, February 1st, uh, that is in the regulation. Uh, we are, however, in contact with the, the county and we are uh, in process to getting the, the, the necessary data uh, and that will be submitted to the ministry. It just will be, it'll be late and it will not be a part of the official submission that is in front of you right now. So through you, Chair, um, do you know when that will happen, Martin? Um, again, through you, Mr. Chair, not what um, we're working with the county. Uh, they have had staffing changes. Um, so that was the reason why uh, they weren't able to, to kind of uh, meet the deadline. We are in, in, in contact with, this, with staff, uh, we're working through, through the issues with them. Uh, we don't have a timeline right now. Okay, thank you. And um, if I may, Chair, um, sure. direct staff to follow up when, once it's been completed. We can certainly do that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Helen, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, just quickly, uh, Chair White. Um, I, I asked uh, Samantha, and I, I'm pretty sure I CC'd you on it to, to connect with uh, Michelle Sergi to to discuss, uh, discuss some aggregate issues. We had some delegations come to our council and uh, they were very technically astute, but I don't believe they were um, completely accurate. Uh, their testing had uh, some incongruencies with our own GRCA testing. So I've asked uh, Sam to, to create a, a brief update so that we can, uh, so that regional council can get the, get the same information that I had. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, let the board know, okay? All right, thanks, Helen. Thanks, Chris. Good, Sam, all right. Yep. So uh, are there any opposed to that motion to receive the correspondence? All right, that's carried. No first and second reading of the bylaws. Reports, we have SPA 042101, submission of the 2020 Grand River Annual Progress Report and Supplemental Form. The motion is that the Grand River Source Protection Authority is satisfied that the 2020 Grand River Annual Progress Report and Supplemental Form meets the requirements of S46 of the Clean Water Act 2006 and any director's instructions established under OREG 287 and that Lake Erie region staff be directed to submit the 2020 Grand River Annual Progress Report and Supplemental Form to the directors of the Source Protection Programs Branch, Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, along with any Source Protection Committee comments in accordance with S46 of the Clean Water Act 2006 and any director's instructions established under OREG 287. Okay, I don't know if there's any questions on that. Can I get a mover? Moved by Michael, seconded by Guy. If there's nothing further, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. None, 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 none. Next meeting, call of the chair. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Moved by John, seconded by Kathy. We are adjourned. There's another source protection belt you can put on your uh, meeting, you can put on your resume. Okay. So without further ado, we're going to move into the general meeting. I'm calling the meeting to order and we'll just certify quorum again, just to be official. Karen? Uh, yes, we have quorum and we now have 20 members present. All right. Thank you. I've made my remarks. So we, I want to uh, have a motion that the agenda for the general membership meeting be approved as circulated. Moved by John, seconded by Warren. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, a motion that the minutes of the general membership meeting of March 26, 2021 be approved as circulated. Moved by uh, Marcus, seconded by Ian. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Minutes are rising, nothing. Hearing of delegations. All right, so we've got a delegation coming up. It's the Grand River, Grand Valley Trails Association. 
and uh, we'll let uh, them do the technical stuff here and then we'll uh, announce it. So, Ian will allow the delegation to enter the meeting from the waiting room. Karen will load the presentation. All three delegation members have joined now. All right, thank you. We have Ann Cote Kennedy, Charles Whitlock and Laura Anders. I wanna welcome you to our meeting. And I'm going to remind you, you have uh, only five minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes here, okay. And I will um, turn the floor over to you, delegations. Well, you know, there are different times everywhere and it's not written here. So what are you gonna do, Jeff? All right. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm Annie okay, Kennedy. Um, am I okay now? Yep. You're Great. So good morning and thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to talk with you about the Grand Valley Trails Association and in particular the section of the Grand Valley Trail that is in the Aurora Gorge Park. Can you advance the slide please? First I'd like to give you a little bit of background about the Grand Valley Trail. The trail is a 250 kilometer footpath that follows the Grand River watershed, hence its name. The trail runs from Bellwood to Port Maitland on Lake Erie, and we were started 49 years ago. So next year, the club will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. Indeed, it was started in 1972 by a member of your own group, by the Grand River Conservation Authority Foundation member, Betty Schneider. She mobilized a group of interested citizens to build a footpath along the Grand River. Initially, they built the 30 miles of trail, or 48.3 kilometers, from Dune to Conestoga. And the following year, that is the year the, the club was incorporated, they extended the trail to the Alora Gorge. Next slide, please. Given that our relationship with the Alora Gorge dates back to our origins, it's not surprising that our mandates are also nicely synchronized. Where the GRCA's goal is to connect people to the environment through outdoor experience, the club's goal is to promote year-round hiking and promote recreation, physical fitness, and the conservation and preservation of wildlife. Where the GRCA's articulated mission is to encourage river-related links and trails, the club's mission is to build and maintain hiking trails in the Grand River Valley. Next slide, please. So we've enjoyed a long relationship and synergy for a long time. The trail has run through the park for 50 years. Over our history, the collaboration has been informal. We did have a, a formal agreement between 2003 and 2013, and when that expired, our collaboration resumed on a more informal basis. However, for reasons that are not really known to us, the situation appeared to have changed last June. Next slide, please. In June last year, we were advised informally that the trail needed to be rerouted outside the park. We've requested information from the Conservation Authority staff to understand their position with the hope of discussing and finding a reasonable solution. And after 10 months, we still don't know where we stand. So the purpose of us being here today is to maintain that relationship with Conservation Authority, share what happened to date, and request a fair decision that will help to resolve the matter. The next slide, please. So we have outlined in the next two slides the chronology of communication exchange between the two organizations. In short, we were advised informally in June last year. We followed up to express a concern and were able to have a meeting on September 9, at which time we were advised that the senior management team would be consulted at, at its next meeting, either in September or possibly October, that wasn't clear. Next slide, please. In November, we were told to expect an update a few weeks, in a few weeks. And then we finally received an email in late February saying the position has not changed and we were provided with a bit more detailed information relating to the rationale. Next slide, please. So we were presented with five factors that presumably influence the staff's position. The points that you'll see in the following slides have all been taken into account and we'd like to review them one by one. So next slide, please. Firstly, uh, there has been an explosion. So what we've been told, and this is directly from the email we received, there's been an explosion of visitors in the park entering at non-sanctioned entry points and trespassers will hop the fence or walk through a hole in the fence, end of quote. 
So we have to say as a result of the pandemic, there has indeed been an influx of visitors on trails, conservation authorities, provincial parks, everywhere. And unfortunately, many of the trail users in, these, in this situation are not familiar with hiking. They're not adhering to the etiquette and protocols of hiking. And most clubs have experienced that. So at any rate, the most important point here though that I'd like to make is that we have no reason to believe that the GVTA members are suddenly climbing fences and crawling through holes in a park in a fence to access the park. The majority of our people and members are seniors. They enjoy hiking. They've been hiking for many years. They're familiar with the trail and they know the trail etiquettes. Next slide, please. So the, slide, the uh, trail is at least one kilometer from the ballpark. So you'll see on the uh, map that we've provided here where the trail entrance is off Middlebrook Road and where the uh, area in question is at the baseball diamond. We believe firmly that closing the Grand Valley Trail access point will not stop people from entering at the ball diamond. Next slide, please. The second concern relates to liability. So this was raised again in that same memo. By way of information, keeping the trail in the park will not increase your liability with hikers because the GVTA has liability insurance that covers hikers for bodily injury, for property damage when hiking on our trails. Next slide, please. The next point that was raised, or the third point that was raised by staff was that the public safety was a concern. Now, we do understand that the Elora Gorge is a large property to oversee. The conservation authorities we have spoken with in fact, value the presence of hiking club members because they assist with the safety of the trail and they assist with the maintenance of the trail. Further, club members also encourage self-policing of the area. In most cases, unlawful activities occur in areas where there is no or little presence or access. Next slide, please. So the fourth point that was raised in that same memo related to um, the staff's concern with mitigating risk by advising people of the dangers of the gorge. So specifically mentioning that visitors are advised via signage, via notices and visitor package, via the permit itself. Well, we have to say that in the club's 50 year history, there has not been one reported incident related to a member at the gorge. And that said, we also want to, uh, to uh, help with and provide mitigate, help provide uh, mitigating risks. We would be happy to include appropriate information on our signage and at trail entrances and member packages in our guidebook, on our website and all our social media venues. Next slide, please. Uh, and the last point that staff referred to uh, related to the Conservation Authorities Act specifically stating two things, that people cannot enter at non-designated entry points and that visitors require a permit for day use. Well, in our research, we've seen there are many, many precedents allowing people to enter conservation authorities at mutually agreed areas. In fact, I mentioned earlier, we had an, uh, a letter of agreement in 2003 to 2013, and that granted club members permission to enter the park in a mutually agreed area. And further, there are many, many precedents from other conservation authorities. In fact, all the hiking clubs that we have spoken with have formal or informal agreements with their local conservation authority. So the list of conservation uh, organizations that we've contacted are listed in the next slide, please. So there are many clubs that we've contacted. They're listed here um, as well the staff also mentioned in their, uh, in their letter, visitors requiring a permit for activities in the park. Well, under section four, bracket two of the act, there's a list of activities that do require a permit. And you will note that hiking is not an activity listed. Hiking is not an activity that requires a permit. Next slide, please. So as mentioned in the onset, our reason for coming before the board is not just to flag what has happened to date, but to mention our ongoing relationship and to request a fair decision to resolve this matter. We do have several recommendations that we believe would lead to a fair decision. Next slide, please. We have four points here that we'd like to raise. So one is as part of our solution. One is we'd like to enter into an agreement that allows the trail to remain in the park. The agreement should outline each organization's responsibilities and we don't need to start drafting this from scratch because as I mentioned there are many models in place 
And of course, we could use the model, but we would definitely tailor it to the Allure Gorge's unique situation. The second part of our proposal is, while this has not been mentioned, but if the issue is economics, the GBTA is more than prepared to pay an annual fee. This was done in the past and we're willing to do that again. The fee in the past was based on 50 admissions a year at the regular adult daily admission rate. Thirdly, I believe we could work together in collaboration to develop and run a public education campaign de designed to raise awareness around the proper and safe use of trails. High Ontario is currently working on, on a similar program that we could leverage. As well, we have currently, we have recently benefited from work from Conestoga College students in the public relations program, and they've created a proposal on this topic at our request. And finally, that is my personal background is communication and public education. So I'd be thrilled to be able to work with you on this kind of program. Hey, and sorry to interrupt, you got about a minute, okay? Thank you. Thank finally, you, GVTA can update its signage website and other means. Last slide, please. Your strategic state plan states that, and I quote, more the role of the Grand River Conservation Authority more than ever and is the relationship with our partners will be critical to the health and vitality of our communities. So I, I'm gonna read that again. More than ever, the role of the Grand River Conservation Authority and the relationship with our partners will be critical to the health and vitality of our communities. We agree, as we approach our 50th anniversary, we would want to work with you and work in collaboration to maintain and to respect this agreement, this relationship that we have. Closing the trail at the Elora Gorge would be a detriment to the hiking in, and would be uh, uh, deprived hikers from enjoying this area's natural beauty. We hope you will consider and honor that this, this uh, agreement of this relationship that we've had for 50 years. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate that. All right. Um, are there any questions from the board? Ian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few comments regarding the presentation. Uh, first, I lived on Middlebrook Road opposite the Gorge Park for almost 40 years. It is not a road I would encourage using as a hiking trail given its narrow shoulders, blind spots on the hill, speeds, and increasing frequency and size of gravel trucks using the road. Center Wellington is doubling in size to 52,000 people in 20 years, which will only increase truck traffic accessing Middlebrook Road's gravel pits. Second, the township at Center Wellington recognizes our residents and visitors' interest in walking access to and through the Gorge Park from within Alora. Our locals are likely creating the holes in the fences as it is not convenient to hop in a car and drive out of town to access the two current entrances. Last fall, Center Wellington CAO, Mayor and I met with senior GRCA staff to discuss the possibility of an official walk-in fee entrance in Alora. The baseball diamond was one of the areas we discussed. The township is committed to continuing discussions and contributing financially to make this idea a reality pending this board's and our council's approval. The township also welcomes the GVTA's participation in these discussions going forward. We recognize all three parties share a common history and interest in promoting public access to conservation and naturalized areas and addressing the GRCA's concerns. COVID has reinforced the importance of protecting a community's physical and mental well-being, and walking in these areas is a means to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Is there anything further from the board? Chris? All right. Yes, Warren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Grand Valley Trails Association has a long history as we have duly been noted today. Um, they really have been stewards of the land uh, and of the trails. Um, I was a member early in my teaching career, and for some reason I got busy doing other things and did, never did renew my membership. But I do use the trails. I do walk with my dog on a leash. Um, it's, it's a wonderful organization. They have been, as I said, stewards of the land and of the trails. And walking, I agree with Ian, walking on Middlebrook Road uh, is not a good idea, especially if you've got young children who will dart here and there, hither and yon. Um, I think we could probably come up with some kind of 
of solution because we're both good organizations, the GRCA and the Grand Valley Trails Association. And I would hate to see this after 50 years. I I'm, I'm, might even renew my membership in, in 2000, 2022. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I hope we can work together to, to make this a, a viable uh, option for both sides. Thank you. All right, Warren, thanks very much. Hither and yon, eh? Okay. Um, is there anything further from the board? All right, Annie, thank you for the presentation and I'm, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Chair, John, John Murray. Sorry, I didn't. John, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. My assumption is that this is being re referred back to staff for report to the board uh, within a couple of months uh, so that we've got an opportunity to understand what the issues are before uh, we push in a given direction. That is right. the plan, right. Mr. Chair? Yeah, to get, absolutely. It's got to come back. we got to take a look at, because this doesn't affect just the one park. We have to, people walking through trails through our parks is, is an issue in all of the parks. So we have to right. figure out what we're going to do universally. Thank you. All right. Okay. Sorry, have I missed anyone? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. We'll thank you. Chat soon. All right. So I don't need a motion to receive the delegation, do I? No. Okay. So moving right along, we're gonna we're down to the uh, chief administrative officer's report. Uh, verbal update, Samantha. Through you, Mr. Chair. I actually don't have any additional updates at this time. Okay. Excellent report. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So G next report: general insurance renewal. Uh, we have. Uh, a motion that the report number GM 042133, General Insurance Renewal 2021-2022 be received as information. Uh, I'll take a mover and a seconder and then look for questions. I move by Jane, seconded by Mayor Nowak. Uh, any questions on this? Uh, John, uh, Bernie? Right? Oh, Bernie, I got John and I'll get Bernie. Yeah, I was just gonna, maybe Bernie should go first, Mr. Chair, because he raised some issues on, on email that uh, I think the board needs to be aware of and, and needs to uh, hear from staff with respect to the issues he's raised. Of course. All right, go ahead, Bernie, I'll, I'll give the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much and thank you, John. Uh, I wanted uh, to get some inf general information as to what's going on. I must say I was rather disappointed to receive Kevin's note that uh, the minister, uh, Minister Clark, is back downing on the, uh, backing down on their promise to uh, take a look at joint and several uh, liability. I'm wondering, as a uh, member, Mr. Chair, if you can give us an update on it uh, when you get an opportunity. Uh, there is that resolution out from Tweed indicating that the minister look, should look at it again because insurance does play a big role in some of these smaller municipalities' uh, tax burden. The minister indicated, you know, he's concerned about uh, innocent act and accident victims, and I'm concerned about the deep pockets that taxpayers don't have. We have some taxpayers that are struggling out there and I don't like to see that. And uh, going further, what are we doing as a, uh, an authority to mitigate any liability that we have? I'm sure we've got programs, but if you can just update them. That's a number of questions, Mr. Chair. I'll get off and let other people speak. Okay, and if, you, if folks don't mind, I'm gonna take the joint and several liability first. And I know Kevin would like, John, if you don't mind, Kevin would like to say something on that, go ahead. Kevin? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, and please don't shoot the messenger, but uh, you know, that's an issue that we've been dealing with at the Ontario Big City Mayor's Caucus, and also uh, AMO, and I sit on the AMO board as well. And so we had uh, an OBCM meeting last week, uh, as usual, Minister Clark was there, he usually attends every meeting. And he did make a very short comment in respect to joint and several liability that they had decided not to change legislation. You know, they got to balance the interests of innocent acts, acts and victims and those uh, municipalities that are paying increased insurance premiums. Now, I haven't seen yet, and that was really an issue that AMO was really 
uh, pursuing. I, we haven't had a, an EMO board meeting yet since that news came out. <clears throat> it wasn't an issue that the OBCM was, you know, driving as one of its primary issues. I think relying on the on EMO is it was an issue that EMO was carrying the torch on. So <clears throat> uh, there will be a board meeting. Uh, for email, I think it's next week or the week after, so I'm sure it'll be discussed at that time. All right, and just to you know, I was on AMO for years in Rome as well, and we had we 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 went to the MOU, and we've been after this for ever 20 years. And there was one point where they were thinking of moving to 30 percent, and it went back and forth. So I'm not sure, Bernie, that we have much to update. I, maybe Kevin can give us something after the next AMO board meeting, but this has gone through several governments and several uh, premiers. And it, it, however positive it seems to look, it seems to come down to um, if there's catastrophic injury, who's going to help the injured victim? A, a child in a, in a, in has an accident and has a $12 million you know, care bill going forward. And uh, unfortunately the municipalities seem to pick it up even if they're 1% responsible. It seems like it should be a provincial uh, mandate, but it's something they continue to look like they're going to do it. And then I think once they do a deep analysis, they they back off. But I don't think anybody's going to drop it. I think it'll be here until until it isn't. But if, if that's all right, Kevin, I'm going to ask you after the maybe the next AMO board meeting if there's any further update. So if there's nothing, thanks. So if there's I, nothing I, on the joint and several liability, your second question, John, I'd be happy to that. chair. I'd be happy to do that and. Um, Oh. advise the AMO board of the position of many of the GRCA board, board members. All right. I appreciate that, Kevin. There, we got an inside. So your second question, Bernie, was with regards to liability. I'm going to take that first, John, and then we'll, I'll move okay. to you. Do, do we want to, who can, Sam, his liability question, do we? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I understood the second part of the question to be about GRCA's risk management programs and activities. And we certainly do take a lot of measures to mitigate risk. Uh, we do regular risk assessments. We have inspections both by staff and third parties. We do near miss investigations, accident investigations. We have thorough documentation, training procedures, maintenance programs, signage, waivers, agreements. And we're, we are very thorough. We regularly review and update. And uh, we also experience the effects of um, being named in lawsuits, uh, even in cases where we have agreements with other parties that we thought were um, adequate protection for us, uh, where the other party would take responsibility under the agreement, and yet we continue to have to defend ourselves in that situation. So we experience those same effects, but we do have a lot of measures in place to manage the risks. Okay, uh, thank you, Karen. John? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I appreciated uh, the comments that were made by the mayor uh, very much. Uh, all I can t tell you, uh, Mr. Chair, is that uh, a lot of commercial entities across uh, Canada this year, whether they're churches or uh, other entities that have high public uh, traffic, have seen increases in the range of 30%. And so it's, it's not just an issue for municipalities, it's also an issue for commercial entities with, with high public traffic areas. And it's being looked at by a number of organizations for that reason. And uh, if I see anything or if anybody else sees anything from a, a commercial perspective, I'll make sure to pass it on to uh, Sam because it's, uh, it's become an industry issue. All right, thank you, John. And Sue, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to, I'm not sure everybody understands what we're talking about here. And it's not, John, it's not just the increases across the board for everyone. Um, but it is states that if there's an accident in a municipality, even if the driver is at fault, the munis if the gentleman or, or person or whoever does not have adequate insurance to cover their medical expenses and everything after the accident, the municipality has to pay for it and has to take over the cost for that accident, regardless of whether they're at fault or not. Uh, and um, this is where it's happening and where it's crippling municipalities because, well, in the last few months, there's been a, um, accidents at a, an intersection in North Dumfries, which is a regional intersection um, in the township of North Dumfries, and there's been seven fatalities. We could be up for all the charges for that accident 
of those seven fatalities because of this clause. Even if the person driving is 100% at fault, which I believe may be in a lot of these situations. So that's the problem is the municipalities are afraid that we cannot be responsible for every accident in our municipalities and bear the cost of those. Thank you, Sue. So the only caveat there is that the joint and several liability means they need to find you at least 1% responsible. So if there's no, if there's an accident, they, they so one of the examples was two kids ran out on a road and, and the kid got hit and the driver had no insurance, et cetera. But the stop sign had been stolen the day before and the municipality was found 2% responsible because they've got the deep pockets, they pick up 100% of the insurance liability. And they look for ways to get at least 1% responsible to the municipality and we pick it up. So this is a, a long-term ongoing issue and thank you for that, Sue. And we look forward to Kevin's update. Is there anything further on the insurance? I'm sorry, did I get a mover and a seconder on that one? Probably not, I'll do it again. Moved by uh, Jane, sorry? Uh, Jane and Joe. Okay, I'm, okay, that's great. Okay, However, anybody uh, opposed? Mr. Chair, uh, Mayor Kevin Davis has his hand raised. Yeah, okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Kevin? Actually, Mr. Chair, I actually clarify, you have to be found at least 1% responsible. So right. It's auto automatic, but you know, one concern is part of what's driving up insurance rates is not just joint and civil liability, but it's also, you know, large disasters, not just in Canada, but North America and worldwide. So the insurers are trying to recover from all of us those costs. Um, when I was a, a lawyer, the, the Law Society ran into the same problem about 25 years ago. And uh, we became self-insured in the sense that we set up our own insurance corporation so that that our rates were based on uh, our claims and not the general state of the insurance industry. Has that ever been discussed or considered uh, across the province with conservation areas, whether they might try and uh, self-insure? It's, it's a big task, but it can be done and uh, there can be a lot of savings if you do it right. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that's never been discussed to my knowledge. We are part of a large group um, but we do still work with an insurance broker. We do not self-insure other than you know, normal deductions or self-insured retention uh, payments, but um, that has not been looked at. I could, I'm on the Conservation Ontario Insurance Committee and I could bring that subject up with them. Um, I would imagine it's fairly intensive and there would be consultants who would have to help us manage that, but we can explore those issues. Yeah, and you can still insure for the huge losses, uh, but. The thing is, when your corporation's uh, reinsuring, uh, you're not getting markets and whatnot. You're just doing it direct, and so it. Uh, but it does. It doesn't make sense unless it's a or large organization. Organization with a lot of resources. All right. Thank you. Is there anything further? Sue. Sue. I just I wanted to tell on. Samantha that, um, and Karen that, uh, Region of Waterloo self insures. So you may want to reach out to them and see how they do it. We uh, did that back in 1998, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just to confirm then, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Good discussion. Moving next to cash and investment status. Motion that report number GM 042131, cash and investment status, March 2021 be received as information. Moved by Bernie, seconded by Marcus. Any opposed? Questions? None opposed. That is carried. Thank you. Financial summary motion that the financial summary for the period ending March 31st, 2021 be approved. Moved by Jerry, seconded by Brian. Any questions on that one? Bernie? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm wondering if you got the crystal ball out and give us any forecast on the final end financial impact this uh, upcoming lockdown is going to cause us and if we have any mitigation members, num measures, I'm sorry. Is Sonia available on? Yeah, there she is. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, Things are still looking pretty good. Of course, the parks, I think the greatest area of risk 
is when that within our conservation areas and the ability to open up for camping. Day use is strong, uh, membership sales are strong, but certainly a large portion of our revenue will rely on uh, camping. Uh, reservation um, interest has been very strong and people are going to come, so it will be dependent on whether the parks open or not um, for camping after March, May 20th. And we were conservative in our, our camping estimates, so there is sort of a bit of a cushion in there, but we haven't um, taken it any further in terms of mitigation if it was drastic such as closed for the whole season or something. Okay. All right. If there's, thank you, Sonia. If there's nothing further, any opposed to the motion? That is carried. Thank you. Moving along to development interference and wetlands and alterations to shorelines. Uh, well, I just read that. That report number GM042130, development interference with wetlands and alterations to shorelines and water courses regulation be received as information moved by Ian, seconded by Joan. Questions? Any, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving along uh, to Conestoga Dam that the Grand River Conservation Authority accept the tender with Maybridge Construction Limited in the amount of $798,910, including HST, as it was the lowest tender submitted, meeting all the tender requirements, and that the ACOM Canada Limited be retained to oversee the contract administration and quality assurance for the project at a cost of $100,457, including HST. Can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by Sue, seconded by Michael. Questions? Any yeah. Are there questions? Yeah. Bernie? I can't see the Bernie. Go, sorry. Oh, he looks frozen to me. Okay, go ahead, Bernie. Thank you very much. I, I see the price, and then I, I see an overseer see fee of roughly 12.5%. Is that in keeping in line with any construction work that we do? That's a large portion of the costing. Yes. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd ask Gus if he can speak to the report in the question. And if Gus isn't on, I would ask that Dwight could speak to the report in question. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's that is within range for this type of work. It's very uh, complex work on this site. Um, so you can see fees in the range up to 15% for oversight on projects like this. All right, and Jeff, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, thanks Bernie for asking that. Uh, the other question that I had was, um, uh, when is this work gonna be done? And when will it be finished? The downstream work, uh, this is the last phase of it. So we'd be completed the downstream side of the dam. And then we have work to do on the upstream four bay of the dam and we're starting to do uh, design and planning work for that. Uh, so the downstream side would be complete with this contract. And then we'd be looking at the upstream side which is actually more complex. Some of that, uh, we're hoping we're not gonna have to, to dewater a lot for that, but we, we have to do the investigation. Okay. So again, when do you think we're gonna start this, this work and when will it finish? This work is intended to be completed over the summer wrapping up in September. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dwight. Anything further? Any opposed to the motion? That is carried, thank you. Moving along to the uh, watershed condition. Um, do you wanna, do we want these or you have the report for your information? And I get a, uh, so the motion is that the report number GM042134 current watershed conditions as of April 14th, 2021 be received as information. Dwight, do you want to just give us a little highlight? I think the highlight to take away is that we've had an extremely dry year leading up to now. Um, you know, you really look at the rain since uh, over the course of January to now, it's been uncommonly low. So we just have to be aware of that. 
Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of the wetlands on the landscape uh, have lower levels for this time of year than typical. You'll note that uh, Luther Marsh uh, or Luther Reservoir is lower than it typically is for this time of year. And it's really just a reflection that we did not get a lot of rainfall along with the, the uh, spring breakup or spring, spring freshet. It was primarily snow melt driven this year, which is very uncommon. Um, so, you know, we're, we're cautiously watching things and, and carefully managing water. Uh, hopefully we pick up some uh, moisture here in the coming months, but at the current time, it, it has been drier than normal and uh, we're paying close attention. All right, thank you. Bernie's, Brian's gonna have to make it rain. He, he already brought this up a couple months ago, so it's on him. Okay, so, uh, sorry, can I get a mover for this report? Moved by Ian, seconded by Jeff. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. So none of that stuff. So we're gonna be moving into closed here. I'm gonna get a motion to move in and then we'll do the technical end of it. I have a motion to the general membership enter a closed meeting to discuss a confidential matter. So we're going to pause the live streaming. Staff, do you want to so go ahead, Joan? Did you get a mover and a seconder? Sorry, moved by Joan, seconded by Kathy. Mr. Chair, if I can also ask that Pam, Lisa, and Beth stay on um, from staff. So are we? Okay, so welcome everyone who's come back to the open session. I guess we're just about to adjourn unless Warren has some words of wisdom. No? All right. All right. Well, if there's nothing further, I want to thank everybody for coming to the meeting today and um, look forward we, to uh, seeing you all very soon. Can we get a move or a seconder and a vote, please, Chris? Can we get a move or move by Marcus, seconded by Bernie? Any opposed to adjourning? We have adjourned. All right. Thank you very much. Chat soon.